and thank you for joining us today for the NCI Community Oncology Research, Research Program Minority and Underserved Community Sites RFA webinar. My name is Jennifer and I will be your WebEx host. Before moving into introducing our speakers for today, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping details. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A or chat panel and select all panelists from the drop-down. We will ask as many as questions as possible as time allows. If you need to view live captioning, please refer to the media viewer panel. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted online in the near future. We also have a feedback survey. Please take a moment to complete that at the end of today's webinar. And now I'd like to turn it over to our speakers, Warda McCaskill-Stevens and Ann Geiger. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our pre-application webinar. Uh, I am, again, I'm Warda McCaskill-Stevens. I'm the INCOR Director. I'm in the Division of Cancer Prevention, the Committee on Oncology and Prevention Trials Research Group, which houses uh, the INCOR program. And I am Ann Geiger. I am the scientific lead for the NCOR Cancer Care Delivery Research Portfolio. I am also the Deputy Associate Director of the Healthcare Delivery Research Program in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. So this afternoon, we'd like to give you um, a brief outline of the program. Um, we're going to give you a bit of background, an overview of the RFA, um, and we have selected some questions um, that we extracted from many which came in uh, to us before this uh, webinar, um, and we're going to provide those to you before we have the open uh, question session uh, from you as the audience. Um, I'd just like to clarify that we have prepared this session for the general group. We won't be addressing specific aims, scientific aims, or specific approaches for the sites. Um, so I will begin uh, with background. The INCOR program began in 2014. It was designed as, uh, as a program to incorporate a legacy clinical trials network called the uh, Community Clinical Oncology Program, and it's the minority uh, Community Clinical um, Oncology Program. It also um, uh, includes parts of the NCI Cancer Centers Program and expanded the research scope to include cancer care delivery research. Our foundation is based upon the fact that we have a clear understanding that most of the cancer care takes place in the community um, setting. Our overarching goal is to improve patient outcomes and reduce cancer disparities by bringing clinical cancer research studies to individuals in their own communities. The network designs and conducts clinical trials and other human subject studies. As many of you know, as we uh, use advanced technologies, we are doing a significant amount of molecular characterization, so we have an increasing number of uh, tissue acquisition studies, and that would be included in this particular category of human subject studies. Um, our scope of research covers adults and children, and this includes cancer prevention, control, screening and care delivery, as well as, as our quality of life studies are embedded within treatment trials. We have a very broad um, dispersed geographical program that allows us to include diverse populations, such as the increasing issues related to adolescents and young adults, the elderly population, racial and ethnic minorities, sexual and gender minorities, as well as rural residents. And this, all of this will enhance us in addressing the issues of underrepresentation um, in clinical research. Our program enhances patient and provider access to treatment and advanced imaging trials. We have a very close working relationship with the NCI National Clinical Trials Network, which is in the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis. We also utilize their um, data collection and enrollment system, um, and we also wish to integrate cancer disparities research into our community network. And this means that in addition to having adequate representation or trying to uh, attain that goal, we also are interested in specific research questions that we can incorporate throughout our research portfolio. We are now in the minority underserved after the application session. Uh, the minority underserved sites are a consortia of community hospitals or 
oncology practices with a patient population that comprised of at least 30% racial ethnic populations or rural residents. And we have provided in the application some suggestions uh, for uh, identifying and giving a definition to rural populations. As you can see, um, we have three components to our program. There are the research bases that really are our research hubs that provide the scientific leadership and the structure to support the community sites and, and then, uh, their development and implementation of clinical trials, and they also involve in the analysis of these clinical research studies. And then there are the community sites that do not need to meet the requirement population specific as is required in the minority underserved sites. I would strongly encourage you to review these components so that you'll have an understanding of how three, these three components are integrated and work collaboratively together as a community and academic partnership. On this slide, you will see our uh, maps. Uh, we currently have 34 uh, community sites and 12 minority underserved sites. Um, some of these are pediatric only. Um, I think we in, uh, were given approval by the Board of Scientific Advisors for the NCI to expand our program uh, to 36 community sites and 14 minority underserved sites and seven research bases. It is important for you to um, visit our website so that you'll have a better appreciation of our uh, breadth. In other words, you see the 34 and 12 here, but you have an opportunity in, in the interactive map to see all of the affiliated sites. Some of our sites traverse states. This is important as you begin to think about uh, how you implement and enroll patients on trials. There may be factors that are state specific that would influence um, your enrollment uh, to clinical trials. I'm now going to move to a brief overview uh, to touch on the scientific scope uh, within our program. We have cancer control research to reduce comorbidities associated with cancer and its treatment, as well as improving quality of life of those individuals who are undergoing treatment or have a history of cancer. We have an, uh, an interesting and evolving uh, prevention research program, uh, which we had a legacy of uh, doing in our previous community networks. By design to reduce cancer risk, incidence, and mortality, I would encourage you here to begin to think about where your at-risk populations are, uh, what are the referral patterns, and what are the disciplines that are, would be required in order to be um, successful in cancer uh, prevention research. We have cancer care delivery research to improve clinical outcomes and patient well-being by intervening on patient, clinicians, and organization factors that influence cancer delivery. This is an important addition to our program at the inception of NCOR. What are the activities, community activities for the minor, or minority underserved sites? Um, they include increasing involvement of the community oncologists and their medical specialties that are related to them and their patients in addition to advocates. Interact with the NCOR research basis. This is an uh, excellent opportunity to provide input on the clinical significance and feasibility during concept development and to bring uh, to the research basis any challenges um, that might occur for the populations that you serve. And to identify uh, care disparities in your local populations as well as to share some of these disparities and your successes uh, at, the, at the local sites that could be shared with others. Increase enrollment of racial, ethnic, and rural populations identified in your site catchment areas uh, to the NCI-approved study. Efforts should also be uh, performed to include sexual and gender minorities, adolescents, and young adults, um, as well as the elderly. There are some study-specific activities that I would like to highlight. The accrual minimum uh, for the site um, is 80 unique participants, including um, some deletion of the populations that you're serving, and this should be as close to 50-50 as possibly uh, you can get. Um, NCI will uh, estimate and provide that estimation for you for the uh, unique uh, participants or, uh, by credits for the cancer control prevention and treatment. In other words, it should be equally distributed uh, for your program sites. Again, this is the minimum uh, unique enrollment for uh, any particular site. Um, you are required to open a minimum of three cancer care delivery protocols per year at the adult sites and two for pediatric only sites. 
participated in NCORE initiatives to document enrollment screening. Um, if you are currently an NCORE site, you are familiar with a tool that is um, developed at the NCI to collect demographic information and to have a better, to provide uh, a better understanding for the network as well as NCI for the work effort for enrolling patients. If you are a new site and utilize such a tool, please include that information in your application. Also, gathering biospecimens for the biobanks that would be uh, dictated and our protocol specific. Just a, a bit about the structures within the uh, minority underserved community sites. Uh, a primary affiliate and sub-affiliates or new uh, terminologies for the existing end cores for new sites. These are the designations that give us an understanding of the structural uh, aspects of the grantee. Um, a primary affiliate is a hospital, cancer center, or a physician practice or other institution where patients and other participants are enrolled or enrolled on a regular and ongoing basis. A sub-affiliate will also enroll patients uh, and contribute to the overall accrual of the primary affiliate, but it is located in a separate geographic location and is a part of the primary affiliate's business entity. Uh, applicants must be healthcare providing entities uh, within the catchment area comprising at least 30% racial and ethnic minorities or rural population. If you happen to be a site that has both, uh, you should designate which of those populations will be of record. Um, NCI designated cancer centers may apply if you meet the criteria of the population that is required in the RFA and that you also bring to the program something specific from your academic um, uh, characteristics such as uh, enhanced expertise and methodology that would uh, help to promote uh, disparities research. Applicants may not be an awardee of a lead academic participating site which is funded from the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis. You cannot be a veteran affairs as a primary affiliate, however, you may be include them as a sub-affiliate um, and outside of the U.S. except for uh, sites that are U.S. territories. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Geiger. Thank you, Dr. McCaskill-Stevens. I'm going to shift a little bit from the programmatic and scientific activities toward the actual mechanisms of the application. This is a UG1 mechanism, and I'm going to go through the title terms so that you understand exactly what this mechanism is. The first terminology you see there is clinical research. That refers to the definition used by NIH, and I will briefly say that clinical research involves interaction with human subjects to study mechanisms of disease, therapeutic interventions, clinical trials or development of new technologies. And there is a link there where you can go and review the more detailed definition. Cooperative agreement is the second set of terms there. And that means that after the award, I and my scientific and programmatic colleagues here at NCI will work closely with the awardees and provide technical assistance, guidance, coordination activities, and may participate in scientific activities as well. A single project is terminology that is used to refer to all of your NCORE related activities. And in parentheses, you will see clinical trial required. And that indicates that these grants will include the conduct of studies that meet the NIH clinical trials definition. And if you go to the link earlier on that page, you will be able to identify the definition for a clinical trial. For those of you who applied to the previous RFA or who have less experience with applications to NIH, I want to call your attention to some very specific information that has changed in the last year, and this relates to human subjects and clinical trials. In the RFA, Please read it carefully and thoroughly and note that there are specific instructions on how to complete the human subjects and clinical trial information in Forms E. There is also a section of the SF-424 Research and Related Other Project Information Form that you need to answer in a very specific way, and I'm going to go over the basics of that response now. 
When asked, are human subjects involved, you will answer yes. However, you will not propose any specific trials when you apply. So that means the study record field should not be completed. For those of you who are new applicants and renewal applicants, you must add and complete the delayed onset study record and select anticipated clinical trial. The RFA, again, includes this information and you should follow the instructions exactly as shown there. I want to go over a few reminders for those of you who may apply. We are accepting new and renewal applications. There is no limit to the budget, no cap on the budget. However, what you request needs to reflect what you actually need to conduct the work that you propose. We want to remind everyone that this is a six-year project period. This is not a five-year project period as has been the case in the past. It is for six years, and you will need to provide a budget that incorporates all six years. We are asking for a letter of intent, which helps us plan for the scientific review. However, you are not required to provide a letter of intent. Should you provide a letter of intent, you will receive from us a notification that it has been received. And I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, but please make sure you follow all the instructions in both the SF-424 application guide and the RFA. Quickly going over the timeline, as you know, the RFA was released in mid-June. The letters of intent are on July 2, on July 31st. Again, these are not required, but very helpful for us. Applications are due on August 31st. Late applications will not be accepted. We hope that the scientific merit review will occur in the time frame of February to March 2019. And our intent is to make the awards in August of 2019. And so that would make your six-year performance period run from August 1st of 2019 to July 31st of 2025. We are providing a series of additional resources where you can seek more information. They are all available on the web. To help get you to what you need most quickly, we have separated the resources into two groups. The resources on this page refer to the mechanisms of applying for a grant. And my program staff colleagues in our two divisions are unable to help with these questions. So you need to use these resources to understand how to complete the application. I want to specifically call your instructions to the SF-424 line, which is the second line. This is a very detailed resource that will take you through the application item by item and provides very detailed guidance about what to do. I also want to call out the NIH assist line, which includes a webinar that you can watch, a step-by-step -step guide, and will give you access to online help. And I want to again reiterate that those of us in the divisions of cancer prevention and cancer control and population <laughs> sciences cannot answer these questions for you. This page refers to the particulars of the RFA and to scientific and programmatic considerations. And these are the questions that I and my colleagues are responsible for. And I want you to note that we are soon going to have a document with frequently asked questions that will be posted hopefully next week or the week after. That will be updated periodically. And I will note we have received over 100 questions to date. So this is a very rich resource. If you have a question, it will be most efficient if you go to the FAQs and see if someone else has answered it and it has, has asked it and has, it has been answered. We urge you to review the program guidelines that are shown here. The link is shown here. This is a document that is downloadable. It has approximately 100 pages of information that outlines in 
uh, NCORE activities and processes. It will be helpful for all applicants, but potentially particularly helpful for new applicants. And then I have provided our email for our staff there. This email is monitored on an ongoing basis, and we are responding to questions as promptly as possible. And so I will turn the conference back over to Jennifer. Thank you, Anne and Warda. I'd like to jump into questions from our audience. As a reminder, you can submit questions by typing it into the Q&A or chat box and select all panelists. Now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Kate. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we want to thank everyone for uh, sending in questions in advance of the webinar. As Anne said, we've received over 100 questions uh, just in the past week, and, and we have put those all together to prepare for the webinar today. So we hope that many of your questions will be answered um, as we have our Q&A today. And then in addition, we will have an FAQ document which will be available on the NCORE website in the next one to two weeks. Um, so we'll begin uh, with our Q&A today. And again, please go to chat and bring in your questions while we're doing the question and answer uh, session. So uh, Anne, I'll direct the first question to you. Does the PI of an NCORE grant need to be an MD? Kate, no, the, the PI does not need to be an MD. Um, are P30 NCI funded cancer centers excluded from these RFAs? So P30 funded cancer centers may apply to be an NCORE research base, or they may also apply to be a minority or underserved community site, which is the webinar we're currently on. Note that if you are a P30 cancer center, you will need to provide justification for what underserved population you um, will bring to the table, and you will need to have other research strengths that Dr. McCaskill-Stevens mentioned earlier. And an example of that would be a public health school which has a scientific focus on disparities. P30 funded cancer centers may not apply to be a community site. Great, thank you. Um, and then a question for just some additional clarification. Is NCI planning to reduce the total number of NCORs? We were fortunate that our Board of Scientific Advisors approved for the reissued RFA up to seven research-based grants, up to 14 minority and underserved grants, and up to 40 community site grants. That would be a slight expansion of the number of sites compared to what we currently have. However, I will note that what we actually award will depend on the availability of funds. Great, thank you. And Warda, um, I'll pose the next question that's come in to you. Will the high performance site status be continued? Yes, the NCI and core high performance and standard sites will continue. Um, the designation of whether a site will be a high performance site will be made after applicants have been selected, and this will be based on the applicant's past accrual performance. For those, any uh, audience who might be new uh, potential applicants, um, the NCI designated high performance sites to give recognition of uh, their funding for increased effort for uh, high enrollment. Um, and again, if you're a new site, that designation will be based upon the accrual experience that you would bring uh, to the network. And the threshold for that will be, uh, is yet to be determined. Okay, and uh, where do we have another question that's come in um, for you and or Anne. Um, it's in reference to um, the populations for NCI designated cancer centers. Could we select both rural and minority populations? Um, yes, you, many, as we know, many of the areas do have rural um, as well as racial ethnic populations. If that is your catchment area, then I would suggest that you select one, but if there are significant issues that would bring uh, wealth and enrichment to the program, to describe the program as well, but to choose one of those populations as your uh, point of reference. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question, um, I'll ask our colleague Tim uh, from the DEA to uh, answer for us, if he could. Um, the question has come in, when looking at the evaluation criteria for the RFA, the approach, study design, data management, and statistical analysis evaluation questions seem more geared towards study-specific criteria. How do we apply this content to our in-course site application? Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> 
the RFA has standard review criteria and also review criteria specific for the FOA. So reviewers will consider the standard and the FOA specific review criteria in their evaluations. Great, thank you. Uh, now we have some questions that have come in related to biosketches. Um, and Ann, I'll pose this to you. Do you have to submit a biosketch on every investigator since the information has already been scanned into the system as part of the credentialing requirements for NCTN? So, Kate, I'm going to back up just a little bit and talk about what is meant by credentialing system. So the NCI has a registration and credentialing repository, or RCR, which those of you who are currently funded will be familiar with. Those of you who are new applicants will not. Although this system includes information about um, people involved in NCORE work, it does not link up to our grant system. And so any information you have provided to the registration and credentialing repository will not be available to reviewers. So you will need to provide biosketches for all key personnel and other significant contributors. And if you go to the SF-424 instructions that I referenced earlier, you will, provide, you will find additional information on exactly how to format and what content to include in a biosketch. Great, thank you. Uh, now we have a couple of questions that have come in regarding the IRB approval of applications. Uh, so one question is, will the NCI Central IRB be able to review our NCORE grant applications as the IRB of record? And the answer to that is no. The NCI Central IRB does not review grant applications. The Central IRB reviews protocols on behalf of the NCORE participating sites. So no, the Central IRB will not be reviewing your application. Uh, the next question I'm going to pose to Amy, our colleague from the Office of Grants Administration. Is it the expectation that the RFA application is to be IRB reviewed prior to submission, or can it be after submission since we only have 60 days and there's an August deadline? The IRB review documentation is required um, for applicants who were funded as NCORs, um, and IRB documentation is a just-in-time requirement, which means it's due after the application has been reviewed and scored and needs to be submitted prior to an award being issued. This should provide sites sufficient time to obtain IRB review and approval. Great, thank you. Um, a couple of questions have come in regarding catchment area and defining cancer cases. Um, Warda, I'll, I'll pose the first question to you. Regarding the catchment area, is it the entire geographic area of a cancer center or is it the specific area from which patients are coming? Thank you. For this question, applicants should define the catchment area based on the characteristics of the patients and the demographics, whether individual sites, the affiliates, and their sub-affiliates. I would also encourage the applicants to include the referral patterns because that might help them define their catchment area as well. And are there suggested resources for population demographic information, including by age and category? There's flexibility there. Applicants can use institutional, local, state, or national data sources to determine the population demographics, um, which may include also the U.S. census data. Applicants need only address applicable patient populations. Adult providers may not necessarily need to do pediatrics unless they are planning to include uh, both extended populations within their program. We also ask for rather narrow intervals of age. We have uh, received some comments that this, that this was challenging for some sites, so we would strongly suggest that you use whatever age intervals are available to you from your um, selected source of information. Okay, and we have one additional catchment area question that's coming on chat. Uh, for the definition on population, is it by new analytic cancer cases or is it the total population in the catchment area? Well, we would like to have the total uh, uh, population area, but we are going to leave it to you to, just, to define uh, what portion of that is going to be your analytical cases. Thank you. Um, there are some questions now regarding the tables and looking at uh, accrual information in table templates. Uh, Warda, if you could um, continue to answer these. Are there table templates available to reference for the requested information? 
Yes, there are suggested tables, and we do apologize. We realize that the link provided in the electronic version of the RFA was not operative, and it's taking you to tables, uh, but rather to the guidelines and not the table documents. This has been corrected. Um, the suggested table formats are available on the NCOR public website at uh, ncor.cancer.gov, and we will include this link in our uh, Q&As, which we plan to post. Um, early next week. Great. Thank you. Uh, should we go back to the previous program data for a five-year accrual table? If you are currently funded in core, then you should be providing the accrual that takes us back to the inception of NCOR, August of 2014. If you are going to be a new applicant, uh, please feel free to go back as many years as you feel that are going to be supportive of your accrual efforts and experiences. And we have one more table question, uh, Tim, that I'll ask of you. Should attachments one to three uh, be uploaded in the appendix section? Are there any other tables that we need to use as the highlighted information uh, refers to tables? Yeah, this is a very important question. Do not put them in the appendix. Okay, that creates problems for your application unless it's allowable appendix material, but put them under Item 12, other attachments, and that's where those three attachments should go. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and now, Warda and Anne, we have some questions that have come in regarding accruals. Um, for, uh, we'll start with um, the cancer control and prevention. Would you please clarify the requirements of participation? 80 participations, that 80 participation doesn't necessarily add up to 80 credits, which seems to be the standard now. For the minimum requirements, we are looking at participants, which means a unique uh, enrollment. So hence, if the minimum is 80 enrollment, we're looking for 80 individuals. Uh, that would be 40 for cancer control prevention and 40 for treatment. There is a differential between uh, enrollment and credit. Uh, we're, we will not uh, discuss that at this time, but however, we're happy to uh, take those questions, and, and I do believe we have guidance in the RFA about the credit system. Great, thank you. And Anne, here's a question regarding um, CCDR activity. Regarding site activities for cancer care delivery research, what are recommendations for sufficient cancer care delivery research activities? Thank you, Kate. If you review the RFA, you will note, applicants will note that there are no specific cancer care delivery research accrual targets. Instead, we are asking that sites have a minimum of three open and accruing studies at any given time. And I want to clarify that does not mean opening three new studies every year. It means that you have three studies open and accruing at any given time. So that could be a mix of new and new studies and studies that come from previous years. I will also note that if you are a pediatric only site, you will be required to have two studies open. And then lastly, I will note that we periodically do assessments in which we gather organizational information, and we will expect each site to participate in those. Uh, we have one more uh, cancer care delivery research question um, <clears throat> related to participation. Could you please clarify the requirement of one primary affiliate participating in each cancer care delivery research activity? If one site participates in all of them, is that sufficient? So each site, each applicant site, needs to be active in CCDR, which means at least one affiliate will be required to participate in CCDR. However, we encourage sites to think about which affiliates and sub-affiliates are most appropriate for proposed CCDR activities and to select participating affiliates and sub-affiliates based on the specific CCDR study requirements. Okay, um, we're now going to move to our, some budget questions that have come in. How should the control prevention and cancer care delivery research budgets be broken out? So I'm, Kate, going to back up one second and say that uh, previously, for those of you who were current awardees, there was a limitation on what um, affiliates and sub-affiliates could do CCDR. There is no such limitation now. Now, for your current question, 
how should the control and prevention and cancer care delivery research budgets be broken out? The R&R budget form and the subaward budget forms should include both clinical trials, cancer prevention and control, and cancer care delivery research costs. Within the budget justification that you attach to those forms, applicants should itemize separately cancer prevention and control and clinical trials costs in one category and cancer care delivery costs in the other category. And in the budget justification, please make sure that you provide two totals. One for direct costs, indirect costs, and total costs for cancer control and prevention and clinical trials activities, and the other direct costs, indirect costs, and total costs for cancer care delivery research. Great. Thank you. Um, and we have another budget question that's come in, and I'm not sure if it might be for Amy or for Tim. Will a revised detailed budget for the initial budget period sheet be released to allow for a six-year budget instead of only a five? I believe that should be in the application package. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Now we've got some questions related to Forms E and the ASSIST and the SF-424. Uh, um, this is the first time we are using the ASSIST for submission. And is it possible that an FAQ or some other resources could be posted somewhere for all of us to access? That would be very helpful. So I want to call everyone's attention again to slide 19 and the NIH assist resources there. Um, those resources include a webinar about how to submit an application using that system, a user guide, and again, access to online help. And I'll just remind everyone, these are questions about grant submission mechanisms that we in the Division of Cancer Prevention and Cancer Control and Population Sciences are not able to answer. You need to use the resources shown on this page, on this slide. Great. Thanks, Ann. Um, <clears throat> and now I'll uh, ask a few more questions of Tim uh, from DEA. Uh, we are a current NCOR grantee and we'll be forming two new NCORs. Um, will we both be considered new, or were, would one be new and the other a renewal application? Uh, the original institution may consider coming in as a new applicant. And if you change your program substantially, that is uh, perhaps a preferred method, but consult with program staff on this issue as needed. Great. Thank you. And another question. Um, related to submissions, is, Tim, is what is needed for the cover letter attachment? Uh, the cover letter one is, uh, I have Shamala here to back me up in case I uh, don't know the answer to this, but the cover letter uh, does not need to request a study section because all applicants, all applications will be coming to the same study section. Uh, and other than that, Shamala, what else is needed in the uh, cover letter? Applicants can indicate the expertise needed for reviews, but not identify individuals for reviews. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and now we have some additional questions um, related to the PHS human subjects in clinical trials information, a little of which Anne touched on during the presentation. So how do we complete this, and do we include information for each of the studies that we are currently participating in? Uh, Tim, would you be able to um, guide them for that, for the, for the clinical trials? For the human subjects? Yeah. Uh, I think Ann covered that very nicely before. I think she has a slide in your slide set which covers that, so I can repeat some of the high points, and Ann can correct me if I say anything incorrectly. Uh, but you're not proposing a specific clinical trial. You should answer yes for human subjects. Um, as per the guidance in the RFA, do not complete a study record and do not complete inclusion enrollment information, but do select delayed onset study and uh, check the anticipated clinical trial box. But I think Ann covered all that. You do have a hard copy of that in your slide set. Great. Thank you. And I, I think the other thing is just to remind people that um, 
In the RFA itself, it tells you exactly what you should put in for the study title, and it tells you exactly what to put in for the justification. So you don't even need to give any uh, extra detail, just put that directly in. Um, we've also ha had questions about, well, where do we put in our inclusion of minorities and women, protection of human subjects? Again, you're saying these are delayed onset. So you just put in the requested information and then in the uh, section D of the research plan is where you talk about uh, your human subjects protection and your data safety monitoring and such. Um, we have another question related to accrual. And um, we're to all pose this question to you. With the accrual data, what if you are renewal application with a new partner being added to the grant? If you are adding a new uh, partner to your grant, then in your application you should uh, describe this site and what you think this site is going to bring to your program. Uh, in your estimates for your accrual, you should get that estimate from that site to add to your application. Okay. Um, and I think we just have a few moments left. Um, I think the number of questions coming in has slowed. I don't have any additional questions. I don't know if there's any coming in, Jennifer. Nope, I, uh, I think we answered a lot of questions that I believe everyone had on the, uh, the webinar. Um, thank you everyone for such a great discussion and, and all your questions that you submitted. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a recording will be posted in the near future of this webinar. Um, the slide deck presented in today's webinar will be posted on the NCORE website later this afternoon. Um, a lot of the resources presented today are also available on that website. Please feel free to continue the conversation via email if you didn't get to ask your question today or if it wasn't answered. Um, so please feel free to reach out on the email that is on your screen. Thank you again for your participation.